involving especially pregnant women. That is the first thing I want to ask. And the other question is about the EU, the, 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 the European Union, the Britain going out of the European Union. But like, if you go to our health facilities generally, the conditions there are not desirable. But like, how many times pregnant women are sent to our labor wards? They are anemic. They are told to look for blood. And everybody here understands blood is not easy to get. It's scared. Families will be running shelter shelter to get blood for their families. And some are dying simply because they cannot have that blood they need for their operations or the bleeding they have or uh, they, that, that they have encountered. People are dying because of the loss of blood. I wouldn't know what plants do I have. Because it's important to train. In this country, we must accept that we have a very small number of midwives trained in this country. And we need these midwives to take care of women, not only in the health facilities, but even within the communities. Um, like the committee, the National Assembly Committee on Health, they can hear me. They have been going around, they have seen the state of our health facilities. They have seen the number of health midwives we have in our facilities. And not every nurse can take care of a, a, a pregnant woman the way a trained midwife can. And there are other small, small things. You can only understand them when you are trained as a midwife. Go to our major health facilities like Banyun, Serekuna, and Eden. You go to the labor ward sometimes, you meet maybe two midwives on duty. When actually the number of deliveries, you see the number of deliveries they have in, 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 in every 24 hours, you know this is not compatible. compatible. Then when it comes to, and we need them in this health facility and we need them in the community to educate, to help educate the women, even not only pregnant women, if it be girls, so that at least they grow up with that to understand a pregnant woman, this is what is supposed to happen. This is what you're supposed to understand. This is what you are supposed to do. So that at the time of pregnancy, labor, and uh, post, post, post natal, you understand what, how to prevent those problems and how to prevent those anemias. I know some of these things would be difficult to, 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 to manage within the community because of the level of poverty. But I want to understand what would be the stand of DOI in training enough midwives to take care of our women within our, our communities, then to the health facilities. And, okay, the, my second question here is because, like, a lot of people are concerned because no country is an island of its own. The Gambia is not an exception. Like a lot of people are saying that Britain coming out of the European Union, of course it would have an impact on Africa and the Gambia in particular. Because we have a lot of Africans, Gambian in the UK who are sending in remittance. A lot of them are carrying on their families, taking care of their feeding, shelter and a lot of things. Like in ECOWAS, we have over 250 million people and other people have believe that the echo to is in the pipeline. Some people believe with the, ex, uh, with the, with the Britain going out of the EU, we can use that opportunity to bring in more opportunities within the African continent, especially ECOWAS, with 250 million people and with a single currency, at least that would help us. So I wouldn't know whether, because a lot of people are confused about that, whether it would negatively affect, of course it will negatively or positively 
affect us, but what can we do to minimize the negative aspect, aspect the, the, the negative aspect that would affect us, or what can we do to promote the welfare of our citizens within the com uh, community of Ecowas? Thank you. Thank you. We do not have a system of education that will bring about self-determined development. And that's what we need to change in the first instance to be able to address our health problems also. We are saying for the educational system, we'll have an academy of natural and social science and humanities, arts and humanities. And we'll capture the most experience in academia into those institutions. And their responsibility is to be able to plan the curriculum that we require in our educational system in all these domains. And therefore, we believe in not just abstract education, it's education to live. Meaning that if early childhood children at Nyapwe could know their parts of bodies, all the functions of the body and say, and everybody will hear them loud and clear, they will tell you internal and external and their functions. That shows you that at a very early age, you can also teach the common illnesses and the sources of those illnesses. So that will add to preventive harm. Moving further, we are saying that we must build the capacity of each village as a unit that will provide social consumption. Social consumption meaning early childhood centers, health centers, etc. The villages should be empowered to be able to do that. And then training with experts. If you can help a village to have a village farm, and the cooperative gives the village farm what it needs to produce and then put it in the village treasury. And they calculate that in this village, we have looked at uh, epidemiologically what are the common illnesses, malaria, etc., etc. How frequent? How, uh, what quantity of drugs do we need? Well, that's, that's, that's part of the health planning of the village. The village also needs somebody resident in the village to be well trained, to be able to take care of the health centers. Up to the level of what level? As you go move further and further, rather than the traditional bad attendance, you have this trained bad attendance. But clearly that can also be done. So within a three year period, you can really build a village to have economic capacity to start the process of at least preventive and curative health. And then we are saying each division must move to the next stage of being having a hospital that is fit for purpose. And then that is the district. And then move to the regional level where you have a referral hospital well, this is really how a state should, should be well organized. And I have no doubt that it is realistic that you can empower village, villages to earn income and to the base of both preventive and creative health. But when you come to the other aspect, that is the rehabilitative one, you see problems starting to come. Uh, today, if you are an amputee, and the amputees are increasing, to be able to get anything that helps you mobility aid is a problem. You see people moving all the way from you are struggling to get mobility aid. And they come all the way down to, to the urban areas only to discover that it's not available. There is no organized system. So in that sense then, you need what we call rehabilitative uh, medicine, meaning that you must organize, you must see that here and there, it's not only to cure and prevent, but all the people are going to have additional uh, health complications that will require uh, them to be rehabilitated, both mentally and physically. It's, you see people suffer from uh, fire uh, incidents, where all their bodies are burnt. If you look at them, it's beyond recognition. 
what we need is plastic surgery. And that is just restorative medicine. But where is it? So in short, we agree entirely with you. But if we talk about Dwayne, this is the precise reason why we're talking about the cooperative economy as well as the cooperative society. Meaning that the village now will not just be a recipient of aid and assistance, but will be a producer and provider of social needs. Now, in terms of, I don't know whether I've addressed that issue, and, and, and you see societies that have addressed this as they move from national liberation uh, should be emulated because those societies became people-centered and they had their foot. The doctor, somebody who will be trained from the village, you go and get training and come and serve. Then go for another six months and come and serve. Go for another year and come and serve. And gradually, they earn all the experience of a doctor. If those societies can do it, then what are we waiting for? Uh, our position is that there is no system, that's why we are suffering. But we can address all these problems. Now, in terms of Britain, we have to understand, I don't think even Britons fully understand what is happening in terms of Brexit. Because these are issues that require study. And to understand them. It's not just because you are a Briton, then you understand your circumstances. Just like, it does not mean you are a Gambian, you know, <laughs> everything about your economy, etc. So, sometimes we believe that people are from country, they know what is happening. But ignorance is everywhere. And I've said this to, 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 to them in this ACP EU parliamentary assessment. And in fact, this will be a major, I'm sure, issue uh, in, in our sessions as we move. Because there is a new definition uh, in the relationship between ACP and EU. But to make matters short, the European Union is a byproduct of crisis in Europe. The Second World War destroyed Europe. They collapsed. They went to America for begging. America said, well, I cannot give you aid until you go and organize yourself. They went and they developed the European Recovery Program. And strategically, each state was to address agriculture, address industry, address energy, address services in order to generate full employment. That was their plan. And they promoted inter-European trade because what brought about the war is protection. I have my country. I am producing. I am selling to you. But when I sell to you, I am winning the market. I earn more than you. And you cannot come to my market. And my people are unemployed. Then I said, no. I will now add tariffs on your goods so that whatever you are selling to me will now be bought at higher prices in order to protect my local industry. And they start protecting the local industry. What did that create? Depression in Europe. Because the colonies were the sources of raw materials and markets, then they start fighting each other in control of the colonies. Isolation. Because Europe, and uh, Britain, was a big colonial power and therefore had the African, the Caribbean, many Pacific countries under its trade. And it started trading with them initially. But because those countries were producing only raw material and importing everything else, and Britain cannot consume all their raw materials, and Europe, uh, Britain had undertaken to try to give them aid, it came to realize that it cannot give them all that aid anymore. So as a result, it saw that it was wiser to join the EEC and collaborate with its own European partners. And therefore they would create their own uh, European Development Fund and it would just be contributing to that fund and they would assist all these other countries. And that is what happened. So now, if the UK is saying that it is going to come out of the Union. So if it is aid and assistance, it is going to solve all the border with all these countries that are in the common. Where will it get the money to do that? All these countries, it's just how the world economy is going. All this will be challenged. 
all these countries are living on debt, on bonds. They are the biggest debtors in the world. And we should not see this from a political angle of anti-imperial. You know, this is what confused the whole scale. You know, Anti-Europe, anti-white, and anti so to a point that nobody listens. We need to come back to the basics of economics and try to understand exactly what is happening to them, and many will listen. This exit is a disaster for Britain. Because the European economies are also declining. And they need to change their trajectory. The whole world economy needs to change its trajectory. That's another issue. I hope university students who are here will now be organizing symposia to engage in this type of debate. So that one can go into concrete terms for you to understand the basics that are behind the developments in the world. So, in short then, if Britain is to relate to all these countries again, and Britain cannot consume all their raw materials. It cannot supply all their markets because all the countries are producing cheaper and better in, in some of these countries. So how can it determine what is the future? So people cannot determine what will happen after Brexit. They're just doing it. And narrow nationalism is not going to help because narrow nationalism is the tendency in Europe. But that is also a disaster. Because the reality is that many of the people who are there working are needed by the European economy. It's politics that make them feel that foreigners are taking our jobs. But the type of jobs that foreigners are doing, many of the Britons will not do. Taking care of the elderly, for example. Some Britons will do it. But that's not a province that can make them earn the type of income that, that, that they were to earn. So at the end of the day, you know, there are many nurses going there. So many in the social services. That's so cleaning up jobs, hard industrial work. So many things are there. So at the end of the day, you also compare the number of Europeans that are also in other countries, but earning high income because of the type of jobs that they are doing. So no comparative analysis has been made, made as to how much wealth is being plowed back to Europe from raw materials, from minerals, from, 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 from oil. So the wealth that is coming from our part of the world going into Europe is more than the wealth that is coming from Europe and coming to this part of the world. It's just from different quarters. So in essence then, uh, we, I strongly believe that this is a miscalculation. And if the uh, UK drives all the foreigners, eventually they see that uh, they will be left <laughs> with themselves and they will start looking at themselves still getting poorer because they will not have the answers to their economic problem. And at the end of the day, you will see change of government after change of government. Conservatives to labor, labor to conservative, liberal. And just, just look at the trend in these five years. That, that's the trend in Europe. It's just changing of governments without solving the problem. So my uh, conclusion there is that we have our problem. We need to sit down and look at it. Not only Gambian problem, but Africa's problem. Because I'm convinced that Africa has all the resources to be able to eradicate the poverty of the Africa. It's just that we have not sat to come up with a programmatic policy document that addresses economic recovery of the African country. We have all the resources. So we should, in fact, be more dwell with that trajectory than hoping to get something off the table of Britain for development. I would like to congratulate the organizers of this cooperative scheme. Uh, it's been, been launched today. First and foremost, I would like you to understand that poverty, we are in poverty in the midst of plenty. Why do I say that? We are rich in our natural resources, Africa, and yet we are the poorest. I want to congratulate the, these organizers for this uh, uh, cooperative 
which we believe that organization is at it. If you don't organize, you have no decision. So I want to welcome this initiative as workers' representative that DOI has done it again. In my mind, the cooperative state uh, as an economic case has long been mandated for years since time of The, the initiative taken by DOI is welcome so far as we are concerned. We, 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 we want to less talking and come into action. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is the comment. Another question it is calling for more action. And we continue to emphasize that you've seen we are talking about the cooperative economy, but we also talked about cooperative sovereignty. That power resides in the hands of the people. This is what differentiates Doi from China, Doi from all Russia, Doi from any other country that talks about socialism. Doi calls for cooperative sovereignty. The equality of all Gambians, irrespective of their ethno-linguistic origin, their religion, their gender, or whatever difference. They are equal. We have no minority in our system. If you go to America, they say the Afro-American is a minority. If you go to France, they say the Muslim is a minority. We have no minority in our system. We are talking about equality of all sovereign governments. And they should determine their manner of government. It's the highest level of democracy. Sovereignty of the people. That's what we are advocating. We live forward. So that each of us own himself as a and know that I am the decision maker. I am the VIP. And I am selecting people to work for me. But we must do so together in order to achieve the result. That is what we are talking about. Since 1990, we are saying government that exists for the people and not the people to exist just for the government. That is what should be quoted as the cornerstone of real democracy. Not only voting, but the government must exist for the people. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Sweden, but I'm a Gambian. I have been staying in Sweden for the past 37 years. I left Gambia, I think, 1982. I have been following Doi for many years, and I would like to congratulate Doi and the people behind this process today. It was not meant that I should be here. It just happened accidentally, so it was not planned. I have some few questions for the position of DOI and to make some remarks before making, giving out those questions because <coughs> I'm a politician in, uh, in Sweden, I'm a councillor since 19, 2002. I've been sitting also in the regional government as a member of parliament in the stock of the government. So, I have been following Doi and I have been sending people who meet me and ask me about Gambia. I said, go to Doi, talk to them, without even telling them it's me who sent those people. I have been following people in the Gambia here, talking to them, 
listening, following the political situation in the country, saw all the statements that have been made during the Jammeh regime, after the fall of Jammeh. I have been following the process, and I think my brother Halifa can confirm that. I mean, Gambia is a small country, and the state that we are in, it is time to talk. So let us talk. And I would like to know your position, because I have asked them before about the three years, five years, what is the position of going. Now I have been seeing statements. Is it possible to do something before 19th of December to make so that the executive, the president, with his government, and those who we are part of the coalition, because I have had people of also claiming that the ownership of the coalition. I can tell you people, to be frank enough, I have been following Toy and Ali for over 20 years. I have been telling them they must try to make so that they unite the opposition. That is the only way they can take out Jamme in this country. He's here, you can ask him. So anybody who is claiming in the media, I have heard many politicians, it's not a fact. Doi is behind the coalition. <laughs> Let me tell you people, I know about it. Well, we just forget that. But I'm saying that, what is your position now? Because we are in a state uh, where in this time anything can happen. So is it possible to have a meeting with the government or the coalition partners to see what we can do before anything happens. That is one. Yeah. Two, what is the position of the party, whether you are still interested to have the three years, but over the five years that the president said, that is where we are going forward. Three, if it is the five years, what is the position of the I mean, party? What are you doing to try to make sure that you prepare yourself for the five years. And the last one is that, I mean, uh, you know there is an organization called Frontex. From the EU, they give them a lot of money try to stop foreigners to migrate from Africa to Europe. As a politician, I fight, I engage them, and I tell them that these people coming here, it's not their choice. If you can help them where they are, they will never come to you. So what position is they also doing to try to see that there is a dialogue? Some of these funds, before they transform it to Frontex, they can send it to the African countries where these migrants are leaving for Europe for them to stay, the youth, because the youth and employment is very big. Okay. What can you do to contribute to that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we declare the Gambia launch in this case. The launch, and uh, as you even the beginning of the question and answers, so please get engaged. Let's begin to build another intellectual uh, tradition for, for our nation a debating country, a country engaged in con national conversation. Let us, let us start. This is the starting point, and we'll invite you again. Please respond positively. We make it big and bigger, not to get us into office but to get the right people in office based on mature concepts. That's what we're calling it. Uh, Brother Sahib, what you have asked is very clear. Uh, three years, for us, this is no longer an issue. To be honest, for today, we have our closure. When the Vice President stood at the National Assembly and said that they said five years, and that's what the Constitution says, for the mandate of a President, we have our closure. What we are now engaged in is preparation for system change. And this is the starting point. All our bureaus, our youths, are now ready. And there are various bureaus ready to launch their bureaus and transform them into centers of knowledge. Dr. 50 copies, 20 to 50, will be in each of these bureaus. People can come and borrow it as a library. They engage in study cells and debate. So. We are ready. The young people are ready to engage, to debate issues until everything is digested. Immediately after this, we are no longer the owners 
of Bonga and Dwey, uh, we have said that Dwey moved into a coalition and existed promoting a coalition for most of its life. Eight years, coup d'etat. After that, Dwey was no longer Dwey. 2016, Gambians are liberated. Now, that's why we have the song from the origin. You see the picture from the origin with the type of hair and uh, so you can see we are saying this was the past and now 2016 a new future for them a new Gambia for a new Gambia we are out to build a new Gambia for a new Gambia how do you build a new Gambia? enlighten them we are now starting the enlightenment campaign and three years, five years it's no longer an issue for them we are going with the enlightenment campaign we are telling Gambians, five years is what the man says. That is what is in section 63. He refuses the prerogative of stepping down through resignation under section 65. And that's good. That is his history. He has written it. That's what people are going to read. His posterity, who should be the judge. What is important is to prepare the people now for system change. That is our task. And we will engage in discussion with our citizenry in order to exchange opinions, if we can influence anybody to move towards the trajectory of a national debate for Gambia's future, well, we'll do that. We are ready to do that. That is the conversation. We are ready to engage with anybody, and we are going to pull. But the other part, well, it is Mr. Barrow, President Barrow, who will explain his case to the nation, and we are confident that all mature Gambians will not reduce themselves into spectators who will be oppressed by the force of the state just because they do not know their rights. Their rights is simple. Criticize, scrutinize, restrain the actions of government, guide them. Five years, go to the ballot box. If you don't want them, remove them. That's, that's what we know. That's what democracy is all about. And every mature Gambian should take a trajectory. Whoever wants to take another trajectory, you have your right. You are Gambian. Develop your strategy, your tactic, what it yields. Live with it. But we are going to live with our tactics and our strategy. That, I hope, answers the whole question. Thank you very much. Thank all of you. In an answer to a question about um, the importance of African unity, that in order to achieve this unity, we, uh, there is a need for a proper program. And um, I just want to. Um, there is a little bit of chaos around this one. Um, but I just, I just want to um, remind you that I, I think um, the OAU, which transitioned into the AU, was an unfinished um, project that was supposed to usher in the African unity um, that we desired for us to have a strong sovereign Africa. Now, um, with the, um, we, we know that there have been documents. There's not been a lack of documents. There's been um, the Africans United by Nkrumah, and there's been subsequently a different set of uh, documents, even the OE Charter. Now, uh, we are saying that that is not the problem. There's not a lack of documents and information regarding the hastening the process of African unification. Uh, we feel there is a lack of commitment because um, we've had uh, failure in leadership and all of that. What can DOI do to accelerate the process of African unity beyond policy programming? And another thing, just one last thing is, um, we, Africa exists in a neo-colonial economy and it would be naive to say that the IMF and the World Bank, we can negotiate with them. We see what they have instituted on the African continent and we have seen America building over 35 military bases on the African continent to, to, to defend and to protect the interests of American capital on the African continent. And this is after a concrete analysis of this material situation. What is Doi saying about this? Thank, uh, thank you. you very much. Uh, starting with your last statement, uh, it is important to understand that the IMF World Bank constitutes money contributed by different countries 
that was injected in many economies to build it into an economic empire and omnipotence. But you've seen China today, and what can you really say? Is China, you cannot say it's naive to negotiate. You build economic resilience and assert. Unless you build sovereign national wealth, you cannot assert your position. So you must first plan, build economic resilience, and then you are bound to negotiate. There is absolutely a route. But fundamentally, is what you said about Africa. Africa is not weak. It is weakened by impoverished minds. All we need, as doing, if we have a position of leadership, obviously we'll be guiding the continent and its leadership towards the trajectory of coming together for the third phase of the liberation of the continent. And that is the economic emancipation. There is no doubt that with the oil money that you have all over the continent, if we have one country starting the process of a cooperative economy and they see you eradicating the poverty of the people, what will the other countries say? Obviously, they are going to see that if this small country, so-called small, can start organizing its economy, its politics, for the people to be the most democratic people in the world, and economically eradicating poverty in their own country, what do you think the other leaders are going to say? They will be pressurized by their own people to look at that model and example. That's how African liberation came. Ghana became independent in 1957, and other countries had to follow. So the economic emancipation will start by, can even start from a particular country organizing itself in such a way that others will see it as a model. Look at Rwanda. What is Rwanda doing really? That is looking, creating economic self determination. It is just engaged in an economic reform process, but it's not deeply rooted economic emancipation that will free the Rwandan economy from dependency or from poverty. But because of at least the gain, you can see everywhere they say Rwanda, Rwanda, Rwanda. So it means that if we can transform the Gambian economy, and we are not saying that you just accept what we are saying, we are saying challenge us. Uh, you are right. Organize all the youth. Let's have more programs. Invite us, we'll come. Then we debate on, on, on the basis of the economy. And we are convinced that as we go, we will convince each other that that is the trajectory we will take in order to ensure that really uh, we, we save Gambia and we will save the African continent. I don't know whether I have dealt on your question. Yeah. The next question. Thank you very much, Honorable Kupar, for action man. My conscience would not allow me to leave this place out of political maturity, out of political dissent, out of political decorum. I wish to use this opportunity to commend Doi for consistently throughout the existence of the party for addressing the needs and aspirations of the Gambian people with dignity, with honor, and with truth for Congo. And in terms of African Union, I couldn't agree with you more. As Dr. 
When Ghana gained independence on March 6, 1957, that the independence of Ghana would be meaningless unless it is linked with the total liberation of the African continent. And Kwame Nkrumah's pronunciation is still valid on the African continent. Neocolonialism is still alive on the African continent. We will organize again and we will invite all of you again in a more honorable manner and in a more decent manner give you the opportunity to speak your mind and even give words of wisdom that we will always be willing to use. Every experience is important in nation building. We said that Gambia must have a new start. We thought it would begin second uh, uh, 19 uh, uh, January. Well, unfortunately, it is a start, but not the start that we envisage, a start that would be non-partisan, but centered around the personality, centered around building one Gambia, one nation, and one people. But they, even though it's a party, we still be working with the trajectory of ensuring that all progressive forces in the country will unite to ensure that we build a Gambia of a sovereign people. Sovereign people without a minority, all equal in sovereignty, so that we can build a destiny that all of us will be proud of. Thank you very much. about system change, you know, Luisa Halas is system change, right? Well, clearly, it basically came on, yes, but I'm sorry, right? We invite to dig a dig, I know, then to dig a message. Message, yeah, I can't tell you, 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 I Okay, so what I'm going to do with that? Okay, okay. okay. So 2016,